Welcome back to the show. We're about to learn the secret sauce. Excellent. Marcus, thanks so much for making the drive up. Which, you're, are you South Bay? I am Palo Alto. Palo Alto, okay. Mostly. Stuff happens down there, that's for sure. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, so we, we have conversations with folks in open source about their journey, what they're working on. And I'm actually, I'm, I'm curious about what you're working on now because you've only just recently left Mongo. Yeah, what I'm working on now is uh, not something I've talked to people about a lot, uh, but what it is essentially is a way to protect people from a new wave of threats, emerging threats. And there are lots of, there are lots of new paradigms in computing that are going to challenge the existing systems. And I think that we are finding our way and we'll definitely be open source. That's for sure. Okay, cool. I'm looking forward to when that comes out. I'll definitely be watching that. But I did want to talk about your journey. So could you quickly intro who is Marcus and like, what do you, what tell you, tell us about your background. Yeah. So, um, I grew up in the city of Detroit. I start. I learned coding from this program called DAPSEP, which was like, uh, it was like a boot camp. Yes. Well, no, it's like a pre-college engineering enrichment program for like 11 year olds. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> pre-college 11 year olds. <laughs> that is definitely pre-college. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I forget what, what the acronym DAPCEP, D-A-P-C-E-P st stood for, but I know something about, uh, you know, preparing kids, just nurturing that itch who want to build. And then and while I was in college, I got really into open source and networking, uh, like computer networking. And that kind of led me to security in a roundabout way, basically trying to provide internet in Brooklyn to people for free. And that has a lot of implications. And you, I never quite got there. I think that's a, that was sort of, it wasn't a nonprofit thing. It's something Starlink probably needs to do for the world. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I learned a lot about uh, the foundations of networking there. Um, and so I started a company that was pretty much a lot of open source technologies pieced together, which is what a lot of companies are. Yeah. I mean, modern day development is, you know, fine if someone solved a problem. So you can start solve the harder problem. Right, exactly. And uh, so like what sort of open source did you use to attempt to solve the problem? So we were using OpenWRT, which is a, it's a Linux distribution targeting uh, embedded routers. Uh, and, and so a lot of people use it, a lot of people, hobbyists mostly flash their routers using OpenWRT and uh, there's a lot of support from the hardware community, the hardware companies, that because they don't, they want uh, this software to work on their chips, on, on, on their devices. And so we use OpenWRT and we used Suricata. Suricata was the multi-threaded implementation of Snort. A lot of people know Snort in the world. It's pervasive at this point. And uh, Suricata, people thought it was a little ridiculous to try to build this with OpenWRT because it was designed for one gigabit per second throughput. And when we got started, most people in the United States at least didn't have more than maybe 20 or 50 megabits per second uh, of uh, throughput on their home network. But then shortly after we got started, Google Fiber rolled out one gigabit per second and Kansas City, uh, somewhere in Texas, maybe Atlanta. I mean, it just started to pop up and then other providers also were releasing one gigabit per second and laying fiber. And so then it didn't seem so silly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned uh, OpenWRT. I always said OpenWRT is the thing I say out loud. 
A, a lot of people say open work. Yeah, it, it's funny about like when you see an open source, you see the things like spelled out right. and uh, you have your own version in your head because you don't, because everything's so async, you just communicate through forums and through comments and stuff like that. So I, I, I laugh in my head when you said open WRT and I'm like, open work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it kind of reminds me of uh, MySQL. A lot of people say MySQL. Yeah. And, but most people say MySQL, but then like people who are, just reading it, they may not know. Uh, they're not. They may not be in the crowd where people yeah. are talking about this. So I think just I try to be flexible on pronunciation. Oh, yeah. the, the pandemic, uh, pandemics, pedantics, and and how you say things in open source. Like as long as there's like vowels in there, let's just all let's all focus on the problem, which is let's use the stuff. Right. Right. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, you were building this thing for, I guess, getting internet in, in places like Brooklyn. Um, I know you from Mongo, and I know you from Search and your contributions in Solar. So, like, how did you get from that point to getting involved in open source on that other end? That That's a fantastic question because uh, it's really roundabout. Is like, so I built... In, in our company, we use MongoDB and Elasticsearch a lot. And we never paid MongoDB Inc. or Elastic Inc., the companies behind those technologies. And uh, at one point, I felt really bad about that deep down. But on the other hand, I went on later in life to... So I ended up going to grad school in Michigan uh, for information retrieval it was my focus, data science. It's like before NLP and transformers were super hot, I was trying to learn these things in an academic setting. I left after a year. I wasn't there long. I uh, didn't stay to get any degrees, but uh, I went back to Silicon Valley because I wanted to work on open source where I thought things were happening. And so, uh, I started to work at this company, Lucidworks, uh, on focused on open source and community building. And S Lucidworks was the main corporate sponsor of Solar at that time, and I, I think they still are. And Solar shares a kernel with Elasticsearch. And what I mean by that is there's a, an indexing technology uh, called a Lucene. It's a, a an Apache top-level project. Uh, a lot of people don't know about it uh they just use Elasticsearch or solar because it's just a an index an yeah. indexing library really in java and and so you get the http like crud capabilities from solar and Elasticsearch, as well as the distributed capabilities and so in working on and working on solar uh, i started to learn more about Lucene deeply, even though I had used it in my company and just took everything for granted, all the complexity. And uh, my my goal, because it, it, it's such a mature code base and it works really well, my goal was to make some small incremental improvements that made it easier for people to work with it or made it safer for people to work with it. Um, and even those incremental improvements in a code base that mature can be very challenging. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, is that is that it? Is that good? You want me to get to the Mongo piece? No, no I mean that's that's good. And I was I was gonna d dig into sort of the the thing you had mentioned that you never paid for Mongo. You never paid for all these tools. Like, did you ever? How did you come to terms of that? And like, do you? Do you think there's a, a problem in open source where folks will take it to a certain level where I'm going to learn how this thing works and ends and outs? And I get, is open source at risk at this point where people aren't paying for things? Yeah, I, I think that's a, a great question. And the way I reconciled it with myself, uh, because I, I want to be fair as, and do the right thing as far as I can tell, uh, because open source is at risk, is I work on... Lucene, and so Elastic, the company, certainly benefits from that uh, because they use it, and they don't pay me, yeah. uh, and that's fine. And they pay, I mean, they're definitely leading in a big way in terms of keeping that project on the cutting edge. They, 
folks in different places also working on it, but uh, I admire Elastic's commitment to Lucene and its investment in Lucene through employing several of the core contributors, several of the committers. Uh, but I went to work at MongoDB and my onboarding was very short, <laughs> you know, because I knew yeah. MongoDB already. Yeah. Like, they, they give, like if you're in a technical job, you have to do like this technical training when you land. Yeah. And it's like, oh, really? I have to do this stuff? Like, I already know how but, this works. But you had been training for the job this entire time. Exactly. And that's the thing, actually. So I, I know you joined our Discord and you're like taking a look at open source. Like, that's the thing that we're trying to instill in our users is like, go build with the builders. And like, there's no promise for a job at the end of the day. But like, I think there's an opportunity for folks. You come out of boot camp, you need to level up to whatever the modern stack or the modern technologies is. Open source is that pathway and that journey. Definitely. You know, I, like, I, uh, a lot of people ask me, like, well, how did you get into uh, this job or how did you get into this company? It's like, I was just working on the technologies that they were using. And so they gave me a call. Yeah. <laughs> and, but uh, I mean, I can't go understated because, like, that's, uh, like you're, you're wearing the Steph Curry jersey. Like I, I do love this. Uh, it was this. Uh, so I'm gonna get it wrong. Chinese yeah, this <laughs> characters. Chinese. Yeah. So like, shout out to the Bay because it's representation of all cult cultures. So, right, so exactly. A nice, nice uh, representation. But like, if you wanted to get the NBA, the thing you're gonna do is go practice and get in front of people who are gonna scout you and pay attention to you. So that pathway is structured where you go to college, you play. And then from college, you get drafted. And if you don't get drafted, you go play in Europe or somewhere else or Canada. But when it comes to engineers, that's disjointed. Like there's a pathway in the college, but what a lot of people don't realize is a pathway in open source where you can, just like you'd pay, p play pickup games over here in Bushrod Park uh, with like Steph Curry's name on the court, get noticed, pick up games in open source. It's like, hey, I found an issue. I'm going to pick this up and I'm going to show my skill. And then so the day you walked into Mongo and they're like, hey, you have a job. Uh, here's the laptop. Have at it. You have that experience already. Right. Exactly. And, and people are like, well, why would I go work on something for free? Why would exactly. I? Exactly. It's a question it, that gets asked all the time. And it's like, well, I was introduced to MongoDB and they hired me in less than five days. So that's why you should go work on open source. <laughs> and... <laughs> We need to clip that. That's, that's like so succinct. Like that's exactly the reason. But like the past performance is not predictor of future growth. So like your pathway in the Mongo, how long ago was that when you started? So I, I, I worked there starting a little more than three years ago. Okay. Yeah. It, but like three years ago is different than today. I think folks might say, oh, I'm going to go contribute to Mongo and I'm going to get that job. I think where we miss is there's other projects where Mongo was three years ago that you could be a part of and see that sort of growth and scale. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think there's, you know, the one of the challenges with open source is like once a company gets so big, it's hard to get involved with the their projects. They kind of, the projects themselves kind of be, even though they're open source, they're really the company's projects and only yeah. contributors are from the company. Uh, and so the, I think the best projects to get involved with are the new ones, like the uh, young I'm, ones. I'm, like that's, that's the thing that we, so we built this tool called hotopensauce.pizza and it was really for new projects. Like as it was appearing on GitHub, it has less than a hundred stars. Like those are the times when you could learn when the documentation, you can learn the documentation as it's being written. Yeah. And like my benefit of my career is I went React in 2014. That's so great. like. I was able to watch the entire ecosystem grow around that first experience. And I don't need to go deep dive in like seven years worth of documentation because I lived it. Right. And I think that could, that can't go understated as well. Like learn newer projects and take a chance and then help out. Yeah. I, I, I think, I think that's exactly right. I, there's the, like the stars are a tricky thing because I think to people, a lot of people, they signal uh, something, but, I have found like some of the most advanced technologies that I have seen in open source don't have a ton of stars and these are used by really sophisticated companies. And these, even though the project seems small and the company is small, like there's a lot of projects out there that I think are, are great ones to take a look at and people should get involved with. 
Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, like this is a. There's so much opportunity there, and I, I'm super glad that you're sharing your story so folks can like take this and then apply it to their story, uh, not sort of like the roadmap. Again, don't need to contribute to Mongo and then five days later have a job. Right. Like that's not what we're trying to preach today, but it's more of like be in the situation where you can get called up and have that opportunity. So I, I guess the question, your time at Mongo, you focused, uh, well, I don't know what you're full focus on, but I know you eventually were on Atlas. Yeah, so I my main focus was search. And any company, and this has been for a while now, Whenever I take a job, I tell them I need 20% of my time to work on open source. And they're like, what? I'm like any open source, like whatever I, whatever I want, because that is what makes me so valuable to you as an organization is I have my hands in these pots. I know how other companies are doing things, what challenges users are, are encountering. And like that just needs to be a part of my time because I still want a life outside of work. I want 20% of my time to be go work on open source. And at MongoDB, like they hired me and brought me in to really define a search strategy, like have a, a, a cohesive vision, uh, roadmap, and uh, product offering that really elevates their platform pitch, right? Uh, and it's still early days for Atlas Search and Atlas Vector Search. Both of those I'm responsible for. Uh, a lot of a lot of what that was in the early days was bringing in the institutional knowledge of Apache Lucene that I garnered from my, my time at LucidWorks or my, my time building my my own company, Nodal Security back in the day, and and working with these technologies at large scale. Yeah. So the you'd mentioned this previously about like the complexity of commercially backed open source projects. Like, do you feel like there's a point where projects can't take more outside contributors or is that something that the company should always defend? Uh, yeah, this is a great question. I think that it depends on, on your business, right? Like there, there's some companies that like they have a symbiotic relationship with outside uh, companies, outside vendors, outside participants. Uh, a great example of that is Canonical, which yeah. is like Canonical needs collaboration with the hyperscalers, the cloud providers, and the cloud providers need collaboration with Canonical because Ubuntu is a beloved and really awesome operating system. And like the chip manufacturers, their drivers have to work with Linux. And so they have to collaborate with Red Hat, IBM. And, and But that's not the case for every company. Some companies are in a highly competitive space. They work on mission critical systems and their collaboration needs to be predictable and cohesive and scheduled. Uh, everybody's not like that. Every project's not like that. So I, I guess I, I don't know. You're, you mentioned Elastic uses Lucene. Elastic had a really interesting journey when it comes to open source. And uh, uh, I, a lot of folks are familiar with like Amazon's approach to Elastic and now has a competing product because Elastic was open source. So like in the day, in, in the world of Elastic now sort of, I guess, battening down the hatches a little bit or maybe going a little bit more closed uh, and less sort of outside contribution. Uh, I don't know what the what the story is there today. Like there might still be taking lots of outside contribution. I have no idea. Um, I don't pay attention that closely, but is that another risk for these open source companies? Yeah, I mean, it's, and I don't know if it, for, like from my perspective, the way I view this is that we're all in this together. Uh, we have to try to solve the world's problems, and someday, some, some, somebody from another planet's gonna land, and then we're all gonna be on the same team. Yeah. And so, like, I don't really think about competition the same way most people do. I think we're all just in the sand, having fun, on the beach. And the interesting thing about Elastic. You mentioned Lucene, right? Lucene is the is the kernel of Elastic. Is there's a lot of Lucene contributors at Amazon. Yeah. So like Amazon employs a lot of them. Amazon uses Lucene a lot, and so 
I think Amazon and Elastic have a shared fate, so to speak. Not, I mean, Amazon doesn't have any fate, but like <laughs> it's bigger than most governments, all governments probably at this point. Uh, but uh, I think Amazon, uh, Amazon search, the search teams, which are, there are many recommendations, like they are, they are in this with Elastic. And so I think competition is healthy there. Uh, and the, the outside contributions that go into Elastic's kernel, Lucene, are not even owned by Elastic, it's owned by Apache. And so I think those are gonna continue, but there's definitely, there's definitely risk. But the, you know, there's contributors from uh, Lucyworks, as I mentioned, MongoDB for sure. Um, uh, a, a couple people, at least, or at least one person. Uh, there's also people maybe at Apple that are working on this Bloomberg, LinkedIn, Salesforce. So there's a lot of folks in the mix on Lucene yeah. and Elastic's not paying those people. So they're doing okay. Yeah. And I think it's, it's one of those things that we're, I don't know if it's specifically the rising tides racing all boats situation. Uh, but the fact that everyone has a vested interest in Lucene's advancement uh, keeps maybe the scales at bay. Yeah, yeah. Which I know I'm just like anecdote on top of anecdote at this moment. So people are probably like this, please stop. <laughs> but I guess what I'm getting at is like, there's probably, there's like, there's a balance of scales. And I think when there's a uh, open source helps level the playing field for a lot of ways. It does. I mean, it would be very difficult for someone to start a company that is competitive with an Amazon native service, an AWS native service, but it's possible yeah. because of open source. And Amazon, AWS still benefits from that because people are gonna spin up these new services in their yeah. cloud and pay them for the VMs. So it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> like everybody, everybody's <laughs> gonna be fine. Uh, if you don't execute, you are susceptible to disruption, or, but and you're not if not constantly innovating, then you're susceptible to disruption. But I think most people, uh, or some people, are going to be fine. Yeah, this might seem out of left field, but like, do you feel like there's a world where Oracle comes back into the mix of people? Like, people will use Oracle; they pay attention to the stuff that they ship. But like, Oracle is not at the level of an Amazon or a Microsoft. That's right. That's right. I think that uh, well, for Oracle, so Oracle is super reliable. Oracle is behind, I mean, they're the corporate sponsor of Java. Yeah. Right. Which has been in the mix in this entire conversation because. And the Warriors as well. That's right. And the Warriors <laughs> because, you know, Lucene, Solar, Elasticsearch, all of those are written in Java. You know, Spark runs on the JVM via Scala. So, like, I think Oracle is fine as well. And they have this very strong open source connection thanks to the Sun Microsystems acquisition years and years ago, but they, I've seen companies move to the Oracle cloud infrastructure that are serious. And so, I mean, with serious workloads. So I think that Oracle is going to make a push. I don't know what that's going to look like, but I'm not betting against them just yeah. yet. You know, some companies are good companies and I don't bet against them, you know, yeah. or some companies like Oracle in my view is so essential. Uh, you know, the database has a lot of staying power. It's switching costs. I do think the switching costs are dropping, though, thanks to yeah. open source. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I think there's a lot of great tools that help this sort of... I, I don't know if the world of multi-cloud is still a thing, because I think people have been burnt a little bit by having too many cloud providers. So we are seeing some consolidation of like, okay, we're, we're an Azure shop or AWS, and we're back to that stage. But the world of like being able to switch over. I think we're now building those dev tools to see like a, a different vision or a different control plane. But so you, you spent your time at um, Mongo doing search. There's now, and you also work in the AI tool, uh, the vector search tool. Yeah, yeah. So like, can you explain vector search for folks who are just catching up today? Yeah, I can. And I can tell you <laughs> like when I first, when I first authored a document and I had to defend it and uh, MongoDB HQ in New York City, a lot of people were like, uh, what's this? Come on. <laughs> this is like oh, oh, about two years ago, almost two years ago. Wow. And so like I saw this wave coming and it's because vec the, what vectors, what vector search is, is really just calculating 
uh, the similarity of uh, different ideas, concepts, or objects uh, through a unified representation, a unified format. So you can imagine, I mean, if, if we represented you as a dense vector, uh, dense vector is just an array of floats, uh, and you represented me as a dense vector, and you represent this microphone as a dense vector, our, our arrays of floats are going to look a little bit more similar than yeah. the array of floats that captures a uh, microphone. And the way that those floats are derived is it's the output of uh, transformers. Um, but large language models are the ones that everyone's talking about today. And uh, if you want to learn about the transformers architecture, it's in, uh, attention is all you need. It's a paper. Yeah. 2017. Uh, who, who wrote? Who supported? Uh, 2018. Supported Google. that paper. Googled it. Okay. It Google research. Which, to your question about is open source under threat? This is what scares me. It's like they they got a lot of co competition from that paper and from open source in their work. And it's like I don't want this to slow down innovation or stifle science because we're going to benefit tremendously from this technology. Uh, but yeah that that's vector search is just like similarity calculating the similarity uh yeah of different people or ideas or text that's in this format dense vectors okay and so atlas has their vector search tool elastic has a vector search tool but now with this wave of ai and open ai there's now i don't know if there's like the when you crack open the atom and you can see all the things inside the atom uh at this point, like you have like a chroma, you have quadrant, you have like uh, we weviate, milvis. weviate, yeah. So like now there's like a, a competition to hyper specialize on the vector part when they have all these incumbents that are doing search. And I think what we're seeing right now in AI is like when Notion ships their AI feature, all those cool AI startups from last year is like, okay, what's now? How are you competing against Notion? So I guess my question is like, is it still Mongo and an elastic game for vector or like should we be paying attention to these new and upcoming folks yeah i i that's a good question and i i think it depends on your use case yeah right like like should you pay attention i think about it i used the json example recently on twitter yeah <laughs> so the a founder of a postgres company was like is there like what's going to be act two of these vector dbs now that postgres has it and all the other databases have it and it's like all the other databases also have json but mongodb is a real company it's a big company and there's a lot of copycats uh, like json focused databases and what i tell people is there's room for specialization at the appropriate scale or complexity of your app and so, so I, the the one I'm most familiar with is definitely Weaviate. I also know Milvis pretty well, uh, but I'm most familiar with Weaviate. And like that vector database is designed for really large scale. Like if you have a lot of tenants, right? You can put sixty thousand, almost sixty thousand tenants on a single shard, on a single piece of hardware. That that is something you cannot do with these lucene based systems all right it's just not going to work i mean maybe but it's going to you're going to have out of memory problems and other issues but i think that mongodb and elastic are great companies so i think they're going to be fine and, yeah and developers can use those they can use pg vector and then there's going to be there's a class of companies or a category of use cases that really benefits from the specialization and the design considerations of uh, Weaviate or Quadrant or Milvus. Yeah. Chroma, I, Chroma I, I am starting to understand what it is, but I think calling itself a database is a little, it's a little weird for me to, to reconcile because I'm still learning how they yeah. are a database.
I okay. like it though. I mean, it's a great project. Yeah, yeah. You should reach out. Jeff's local, and uh, in Oakland. Actually, no, he's in SF. We okay. actually just had him on the podcast. Oh, fantastic! Uh, so talk through that whole trajectory of how they're working on that problem. Yeah, I, I think I think that it, again, Chroma is is great for. It's really friendly for Python developers, which yeah. is important. Uh, these other these these other systems are are less friendly. Maybe they're getting more friendly, uh, but. Um, I'm excited about all of them. I think they're all going to grow. I see applications and and opportunities for each of them. There's also like Redis has a vector offering. Okay, I did not know that. Yeah, and so like they all have a sweet spot, and you have to play around with them and try to figure out which one is the best for you. But I think they're going to be around f for a long time. Yeah. It's not going to be a winner take all thing, sort of like JSON. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, this um so I taking a full circle, you had mentioned didn't pay for Mongo, had had to come to terms with that. The one thing that I do know as we were exploring Elasticsearch for for our product, like Elastic Elasticsearch can get expensive. Like they're Very expensive. there's a cost. So like they're they're fine, they're making money. Mongo definitely knows how to make money. Yeah. Uh, and I think their ask their Atlas program or their product itself is a really good on ramp into eventually spending more money uh, right. with Mongo, but like the tongue in cheek, but like seriously, open source projects figured out how to monetize the the product. The thing, I guess the one thing I take a step back on is like if the vector search tools, a lot of them don't have pricing. They're still pretty early and just coming out the gate in the last couple of years. Uh, I wonder, are they price competitive? Well, the last, I mean, this is all speculation. I don't know if you have an answer to this, but I imagine like when all this pricing for things like all these AI tools, like we're now seeing OpenAI actually reducing their pricing recently. Um, I don't know what the reasoning was for that um, that announcement. I didn't know they cut like things in half for sure. Yeah, so so there's a, a few things going on. One of those things is there's definitely margin compression. Margin yeah. compression because there's so many competitors. Yeah. Right? And then there's also this... Uh, precipitous drop in the cost of training these models. Yeah. And people are still spending a ton of money on training models and on GPUs and, and trying to build up their their AI moat, I guess, based on their data. And the the money, I think, in the short term is definitely in GPUs, but in the long term, it's going to be on the CPUs, yeah. like inference and and real-time systems and these i don't think these vector database companies need to be focused like if you over rotate on revenue which is an output right if you over rotate on revenue you might miss the opportunity to 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 win over developers and gain their trust and yeah. these systems need to be open source they yeah. need to be auditable this is this is too important a technology people are not exactly sure how all these systems work and how these things work and so i think f for the public's sake we need these tools to be open source so that they can be audited and evaluated and scrutinized yeah i don't trust these closed source ones yeah yeah i mean that, that is a the, the closed source the black box like those situations are always not not concerning it's, it's interesting especially when your competitions like open ai now closed source uh there's certain extraneous things that they're they're doing that are still open um very little i guess is 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 worth looking at i guess gpt um three might get open sourced again or not again but open source because then they've moved on so let's just all learn off that thing right um but then you look at the llama v2 that just came out from meta like now the the, the question is like okay, now meta is catching up in all the head start that open ai had open source is a way for them to catch up because you get adoption, interest, feedback, research much faster than like, hey, pay me, you know, the couple cents uh, per minute or a compute or I guess the tokens is what OpenAI has. Pay for the tokens and then you'll learn how to use this. Like Llama V2 is like self-host it, do what you wish, build it in public. Like we're all going to learn together. Yeah, I, I think that's the right approach. I think a lot of people have been heavily critical of uh Facebook and now Meta because of, you know, some accusations or some of their usage of data or people's just general privacy concerns. They 
are doing the right thing by taking all that information that they've gathered over the years and open sourcing the model. So I don't know exactly what how this is going to play out. I don't know if you saw on on Hugging Face the uncensored llama too. No. Oh yeah. So some people have uh, have fine tuned these models or changed some parameters, changed some tune some hyper parameters, and now there's like uncensored llama twos out there, and people are. I mean, they're saying crazy things. And so we need to be like, it's not going to be computers versus humans. It's going to be good computers and good humans versus bad computers and bad humans. Yeah. And so we need to keep an eye on these systems and understand how they work and put all the experts together so they can see it and, and pick it apart because it's, it's just too significant. This technology is it. And I'm not all LLMs. I'm not one of those people. I mean, I've been using LLMs for a long time. I'm, I'm not, or language models in general for a long time. I'm not like on the hype train. I'm just saying, pay yeah. attention, dig in. If you have one area of expertise, apply your area to this to understand. Yeah, I mean, but you spent your early part of your career in like understanding like threat vectors and security and stuff like that, where now the federal government has a directive of folks who interact in open source or contribute open source, but are in a sanctioned company, or sorry, country rather, so like China, Crimea, et cetera, can't do government contracts if you're using open source that touches that situation. I forgot what the, um, there was a paper that went out a couple years ago and everyone was kind of like circling the path. I don't actually know when the deadline is for that to be enacted, but the other thing, the concern is like, do you have bad computers and bad humans driving open source is that something that's in your purview and like what you're paying attention to now? Yeah, it, it is. I think about this a lot because like my most recent contribution to Lucene was around, uh, it was something obscure related to, um, related to a query parser. I can't even remember now. It's so long, it's a few months ago, but the person that I worked on, worked on it with was, it is based in Russia. And obviously I want to defend my country, uh, support America allies, more American allies and uh, defend our values. This, these things are really important to me, but the, the job of maintaining these mission critical systems that handle this large scale sort of transcends geopolitical boundaries like we need all the help we can get and like this the the committer the PMC member from the Lucene uh group that merged this PR I don't think he's thinking about I mean I don't know actually he's closer to conflict than I am maybe he is thinking about this a lot based on the news but like he and I were just working on software we were just solving a scientific problem uh and he's working with everybody, like everybody's working with him. He's just one of the people. And there's, in some of the other projects, there's definitely people in these sanctioned countries. And, and uh, I think they're, you know, we're safer in the fact that the software is open. So we know how it works. They know how it works. We all know how it works. And uh, one, one more thing about it is like one time, I went to a, um, I made a change, like a small documentation change in this project called IOTDB, which I was playing around with a long time ago. And I also made the change in Chinese. I used like Google Translate. I know a little Chinese, but. <laughs> I was going to ask, you know Chinese? <laughs> a, a little bit. Idian, Idian. Okay. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> Ni hao. That's, that's, that's what I got. That's good enough, you know. And, and so <laughs> the. You know, there's people on that project who are based in China, and I think we're building these systems for the globe. Like, the, the whole world runs on Linux, everybody. Doesn't matter which side you're on and which, uh, you know, nation you represent. I represent America, and I love America, but I'm still collaborating with scientists everywhere. 
yeah. period. Engineers everywhere, full stop. Because I have to, because there's, there's not that many people. There's like 90, there's like 95 solar committers. There's like 30 of them that are really active. These people live in all, they, in all different countries, but this project is powering everybody's world, like global markets, like it's critical to global markets, critical to uh, every health system that's digitized, uh, which ours is only partially digitized. Like It's critical to a lot of commerce. It's critical to research and, and academia. So like, we're all in this together. It's just humanity trying to solve problems. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, th there's a lot as like the, the one contributor to Mongo, to solar, to Wasim, like your, your pathway, there's a lot of things that you, you collaborate on, but also impact and like understand that you're a global citizen, that you, there's an opportunity for folks to have documentation in Chinese or, or et cetera. And, researchers coming from other place like i think sometimes we kind of get lost in the sauce on that and like forget the interest in how how broad this impact is there there was one uh one story and it, there's there many stories like this but there was one one kid and he was a young engineer in bangladesh wrote a uh, a search engine for hadiths um and posted it on reddit and it went viral and it was built with MongoDB. He open sourced it. He wasn't using search. He was using like text matching, regular expression. And I went to the GitHub and opened an issue and dropped in some code and was like telling him this is how you can fix some things. Then we had a, a Zoom call. And then he made these changes, introduced some new features, got some new capabilities, improved performance. And we wrote a, he wrote a blog about it. <laughs> and after that, he got hired by a pretty sweet company in Amsterdam. Wow. And like, that made me really happy. That was a big thing for him. And I, I've had this occur with a few different people in a few different places all over the world. Like I work with kids in Colombia, kids in Venezuela, kids in Nigeria, kid, one, one, one kid in Zambia, uh, I think Zambia and just many other countries where people are, con you know, collaborating in open source and, and taking their careers to the next level. So I think that's, that's what this is all about for me. Yeah. And I appreciate that. And I appreciate you joining the, the discord just recently and uh, offering your skill set and uh, collaboration. Yeah. yeah. I'm super excited to, to, to see what comes of it. I'm going to try to, you know, pick up, one of those good first issues. All right, let's do it. <laughs> you know, uh, my TypeScript is a little rusty, but it's going to have to get polished soon because I'm in a startup and there's only yeah. three of us. And so that means <laughs> we're all everything. So. Yeah, well, we have a, we do have a, um, uh, a Rust project and we do have go, our, our infrastructure is built in Go. So oh, fantastic. Um, yeah, plenty of places for folks to jump in. And like we're, as we see a need, we're building new projects to solve problems, to keep our core product moving forward, but every now and then you do a little, little side project, a little juice into the, uh, the roadmap. So that's fantastic. I'm, I'm so excited for, for your, your company and your project. Like I want people to stop looking at <laughs> GitHub stars and thinking that's the only yeah. metric. There's a lot more to it. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot more to open source. Yeah, for sure. So thanks for the time for the conversation. We'll wind down now, but, uh, folks stay saucy. Yeah.